Ben McIntyre, international man of mystery, author extraordinaire, and writer of my book at the moment, uh, The Spy and the Traitor, which I think, I think is your best yet. That is incredibly kind of you. Um, do you think it's your best yet? I think it's, I don't know. I think it, it it's too be. early to say. Too early to say, we'll see the sales next week. I, I love doing Agent Zigzag, which was the one that got yeah, me on this, great on this course, but it's a different, this is a very different one. This, this one had the huge advantage of the fact that the main character is still alive, yeah, and therefore yeah. you get that kind of lovely granular. Sort yeah, of no. no, absolutely, and, and I, I really so. want to talk about that because I think it's one of the, 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 the main attributes of the book. Uh, let's talk a bit about, it's about Oleg Gordievsky. Um, now, first of all, let's talk a bit about what, who he was, and also what led you to the subject. Well, Oleg Gordievsky was, I think without exaggeration, he was certainly Britain's most significant agent of the Cold War. I mean, he, and unlike most spies, he actually made an enormous difference to policy. I mean, spies yeah. oil the wheels of diplomacy, they may make us safer, they may not, they may do all sorts of things, but seldom do they actually get into the core of political decision making. He did that. I mean, he was, he was privy to such vital secrets inside the Kremlin that actually the information was going not just to Downing Street but all the way to the Oval Office. So so he's important in that respect. So he's um, a geopolitical figure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, we can get into this, but you know, when Gorbachev visited in 84, Oleg Gordievsky, as the sort of designated head of the KGB in London, was writing the briefing notes for Gorbachev of, of what he was to say to Thatcher. But of course those briefing notes were actually being written by MI6. So it's the only time in history... A slightly circular. A slightly circular. It's the only time in history that a spy has briefed both sides. So when, when Thatcher emerged saying, we can do business with this man, partly because Oleg had She was doing business it. with herself. Yeah. I mean, Oleg had rigged it. I mean, he, he, you know, he was choreographing the whole thing. And that's just one example. So, so he's highly significant in that, in that way. Now, you've written all sorts of books. Um, I, I think I'm right in saying your first book was about Nietzsche's sister yes. founding a colony in South America. Yeah. What was the route that led you to this particular subject? Well, this one, well, two things really. One is that having done Kim Philby, having written the Kim yeah. Philby story, which I f was fascinated by, but it's pretty, I mean, it's turf that's been pretty well tilled. Um, and that, of course, is the story of the MI6 officer who is secretly a KGB double agent. Yes. In a way, there was a logic to doing Oleg, who is the next story along yes. in lots of ways, who is obviously the KGB officer who is working for MI6. And their stories do intersect at various points as well. So there was a logic that way. It was also... Uh, and he, and, and he uh, at a very gripping moment in the story when he's interrogated by his KGB comrades, um, drugged, um, he, 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 he remembers Philby's um, lessons about how to avoid detection. Yeah. An I mean, amazing... It's a brilliant of, irony, isn't it? Yes. In, a, in a, some strange way, Philby, who was, by that point, long gone, yeah. uh, or was about to go, was sort of inspiring him on how to withstand interrogation. And so there's another moment... Thanks where, to Philby. Thanks to Philby, Cordes he got he wasn't blown. But F Philby very nearly blew him as well, because at the point, there was one point when Oleg was producing information about spies in, in uh, Soviet spies operating in, in Scandinavia. And one of them was arrested, a, a woman called Gunvar Harvik. And the KGB launched an internal investigation to try and work out what had gone wrong. And Philby, who was then sort of in retired exile in, in, in Moscow, was asked as a sort of professor emeritus of, of espionage to try and work out what had gone wrong. And the old fox went through all the files and worked out that there, was, there must be a KGB mole. There must be somebody within the KGB. Control and, style. Control style. And, yes. and Oleg was one of, of uh, several officers in the third directorate who was summoned to see the head of the third directorate who said, there's a mole in our midst and he's probably standing in this room. And Oleg felt his hands go completely cold as this, you know, and it was Philby. It there was are, Philby there are four of them in our line. Uh, exactly. Yeah, so it really, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of pat question, but there must have been times in this when you felt you were inhabiting a Le Carre novel. It's such, it's such a cliche, but it really is true, isn't it? Well, I mean, it is the, true. The twists and turns are it's amazing. Not, yeah, it's not entirely accidental that, because I think also, to some extent, uh, modern spies also inhabit, I mean, quite <laughs> self-consciously inhabit the world of Le Carre. I mean, we'll, we'll get to this in a moment, but, but the, the actual escape plan that was framed up, I think more or less came directly from 
over reading of John the Carey and the spy stories because it is so dramatic it is so melodramatic if you put it in fiction actually it's too melodramatic because uh, John the Carey is far more subtle than this you I know, did feel that at some point be Peter Gwillem would walk onto the scene <laughs> and kind of be completely at, at, at home yeah. or solid in the middle well, but I mean spies only, only the mafia and the police are more conscious of their own mythology uh, then, yes. you know, they, they all read John le Carey. Yes. Some of the language of John le Carey has been adopted. Into and we know language. Marcus Wolf uh, was an obsessed, was obsessed, obsessed by, absolutely. by absolutely. So it's also. not entirely. If, the, if elements of this read like spy fiction, that's possibly that's not, not entirely, entirely accidental. accidental. Let's go back to. Um, I mean, who was Gordievsky? What, what before his defection? What was his status? How had he arisen? Well, I mean, Oleg was a pure product of the KGB. I mean, he was a child of the KGB. His father was a KGB officer. His brother was a very distinguished KGB officer. He was brought up in a KGB compound. He ate KGB food. I mean, they had, you know, he was a pure product of that system, which is what, in a way, makes his, makes his decision, his ideological flip so extraordinary. He was, in his own words, he said, I was homo sovieticus. Yes. You know, I was... He was the head of the Komsomol at his school. He graduated with... And he never really considered being anything other than a KGB officer. He was born into it. So gi given that, that he comes from, I mean, to stick with the, the Le Carre analogy, you know, he's, he's a proto Kala. I mean, he's a man of iron Soviet breeding. Mm. How does he make this extraordinary flip? Well, it begins quite early, and I think it is, it's sort of, a, there is something in Oleg's character that is different. I mean, he is, he is a very solitary, lonely, clever, self-driven person. And quite early on, he, I think, began to question the system he was in. That was partly because he was studying German at university, which meant that he had access to Western media, so he could read Western magazines. So that began to trigger a certain questioning attitude in him. He then, he also knew, a, a, and this character played a very important part in his story, a, a Czech student called Stander Kaplan, who would eventually defect to the West, but who already, when they were at university, was showing signs of dissidence, a little subtle sort. But for Perling, I think the critical moment, I mean, the first absolutely critical moment, came in 1961 when he was in East Germany and he was on a sort of secondment program there. He was staying in the KGB enclave in Karlsruhe. And he witnessed, the day after he arrived, they began building the Berlin Wall. And he watched it from his, from his room, this, you know, tons of, uh, of cement and barbed wire and armed guards. And I think for him it was an incredibly shocking moment. And, it, and he, this physical manifestation of the division of, of, of Europe, a wall that was technically being built to keep the fascists out of, out of the great socialist paradise, but was clearly a prison wall to keep the East Germans in. And Oleg was no fool. And I think that was a vital moment when he began to kind of realise that the world he'd been brought up in was a massive lie. You also describe it, uh, there's a very interesting the strand in the book where you, you talk about it as a cultural rebellion. Mm. You know, he's, he's a very cultured man right. and he regards, and this interested me because uh, Russians tend to regard themselves as very cultured, but his view was that the Soviet system was very philistinic. Yes, I mean again that came really from his initial visits to the West. It was when he first arrived in Denmark and realised that there were, I mean he was a great classical music aficionado, and, and, and he realised that there were beautiful sounds, wonderful compositions that he was unable to hear in his own country. Uh, and he found that absolutely astonishing. And, and the same with literature. He began to read much more widely in the West. And he was buying books that he would never have been allowed to keep in, uh, or even get hold of in, in, in the Soviet Union. And I think, so I, it was partly, a, I mean, I think he's also a man of high culture. I mean, he, he considers himself to be, and he is, extremely learned in the higher realms of culture. And to be denied that, he felt, was a sort of an extraordinary cultural crime, really. And it was particularly when he went back to, to Moscow the first time after having been in Denmark, and, and the, sort of, the, the sort of Stalinist music being blasted out in the streets wherever he went, yeah. drove him slightly mad. Did he have, a, a, at any point, moments of doubt where he thought of the West as um, decadent? And the, 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 the capitalism as a system that degraded the soul. The, did he ever have a sort? Was there a tug back to Soviet ideology? Yes, I think there was. I mean, it would be quite wrong, as it always is in these stories, to assume a linear conversion. It, yeah. does, it does, doesn't work that way, you know. Yes, and he was pulled by many other factors, including his great affection for many of his KGB colleagues. Um, the, and he, you know, there were elements. I think of the, he would he would probably not say this now, but at the, when he was in his twenties. There were elements of the Soviet communist system that he that he admired and, and believed in. So yes, it's not a it's not a direct 
absolute flip over. It, it takes a lot of time. Did you, in your conversations, detect a kind of moment that came close to being the tipping point? I mean, obviously, it's a, clearly the book, the, the, the description of his, uh, the evolution of his uh, defection. It is, you know, it is a slow process, but was there something that tipped him over? Do you think? Yes, I think there was, there was one signal event, and that was the crushing of the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia. By that point, Oleg had been en poste in, in Denmark as a, as a, as a undercover, as a, as a technically a, a diplomat, but actually working the illegal system, which are the undercover agents uh, in Denmark. And he, like many others actually, observed the liberalisation taking place in Czechoslovakia under Alexander Bubček and, and believed this was the way of the future, believed this was going to be socialism with a human face, that the world was improving, the, socialist, the, the sort of communist world was improving. So when the Soviet tanks rolled into Czechoslovakia, he was absolutely scandalised. I mean, he, he was almost personally affronted. I mean, even today he talks about it as being a sort of an assault that was completely unacceptable. And he did something, actually in retrospect, very brave, which was that he deliberately went to a telephone inside the Soviet embassy in Copenhagen that he knew was being bugged by Danish intelligence. And he called his wife at home, also knowing that their home telephone was bugged, and delivered a harangue about what had happened and said, this is absolutely disgraceful. You know, the Soviet Union is not going to get away with this. This shouldn't be allowed to happen. And he was sending a signal to the West. He was saying, I am not like the other KGB officers. To MI6 or to CIA? Well, I think initially, or... well, initially to PET, which is the, yeah. the, the shortening of the, of the Danish intelligence service. I can't possibly pronounce it in Danish, but, but let's they call probably it PET. Can't they probably can't either. Yeah. Um, but he was sending a signal. And the irony, of course, is that it was missed. I mean, the, the PET didn't pick it up. They didn't spot this first waving, very small waving of a flag saying, I'm different, come and, you know. And Ernie was astonished that it hadn't been picked up. But it was, for him, that was the critical turning point. It's interesting you mentioned that because one of the things about the book that I enjoyed was the, the fact that there are these human errors along the way, home and odds moments, where things that, you know, great signals of great subtlety but enormous tension are sent up and just get missed. Get missed? Well, I mean, it's As a of human course, it's human, human error. Only in fiction yeah. and bad spy fiction does this stuff work perfectly. Yes. It, it, it never works perfectly. It's all about sort of reading other human beings and we're such fickle creatures, you know. It's all about personality and error and luck. I mean, the luck that goes into this story. Well, that was, I mean, I, I came away feeling that, you know, he, 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 it's an extraordinary story and one of incredible valour on his part and ingenuity on the part of Western agents. But also, it could at so many points have gone wrong. Right. It? I mean, it came down in the end to 80 seconds of good luck. A bit of weather, a bit of traffic. <laughs> I mean, like all things in human, in human fate, I mean, I think Erdogan himself doesn't see it as something that was inevitable. There was, this was, there was no kind of, there was no inevitability about any of this story. It could all have gone wrong at almost any moment, and very nearly did. The, the, the moment where he's, go back to the moment where he's interrogated, I mean, do, does he really think to this day that if he hadn't taken the speed, taken some speed that morning, yes, that that, he believed, counteracted whatever drug the KGB had given him? I mean, or was or was it a, a mental strength? I mean, what enabled him to hold out? Because clearly he did just just enough. Just enough. Well, do you know? I think I think I, I think the, the sort of tran it wasn't a tranquilizer. It was a, as you say, it was sodium. a pep pill yeah. that he was taking. That, well, oh, he the, was given he was given sodium pentothal. Yes. It doesn't really work as a treat drug anyway. I mean, it's, I'm not sure there is any such thing as a yeah. treat drug, but it was certainly eroding his defences, and he was beginning to lose control and he did as you say take this kind of pet pill which had been given to him by MI6 and that probably helped but actually interestingly I think the critical thing that he did was he, he accused his interrogators of being Stalinists and, and they so were very affronted they were ex they were legal minded people I mean they were brutal people, <laughs> but they were they were legal they weren't having that they weren't having that and, they, <laughs> and he said you know it's like 1938 you're trumping up charges against him and they were furious I mean you know and it's rather comical in yeah, and he apologises so I'm he terribly sorry I'm so sorry so about rude about I was in a need to be funny rude. mood but it's, it's very interesting and it's one of the reasons I think why they still allowed Oleg more or less to kind of it wasn't running free he was under Total surveillance, yes. but he was a he wasn't clapped in irons and thrown in the Lubyanka, even though they knew for a fact by that point that he was a mole. So one of the reasons was they wanted to catch him. They wanted to catch him actually meeting his his his, his um, MI6 officers. 
So they wanted. So, so at that point, they wanted to find out who was who was running him. Yeah. Uh, they wanted a huge diplomatic explosion. I they see. wanted to be yeah, able yeah. to catch MI6 in contact with their spy. And then, um, I mean, I don't want to give away too much of the story because it really, you know, it really would be the, the spoiler of all spoilers. But the last third of the book is as good as any historical narrative I've ever read. It's amazing. Um, now, talk about, I mean, without giving away too much of the story, talk about how you reconstructed, you used the word granular, and that is that occurred to me as I was reading it, this extraordinary story, minute by minute, of how he gets out. How, how did you go about constructing that? Well, I was very lucky. I mean, the, the simple answer to that is that I was able to interview every single participant in that, on, on all sides. I mean, the KGB officers were prepared to talk to me, the CIA was prepared to talk to me, but critically, all of Oleg's MI6 officers were, were happy to tell their part of the story. And when you've got a dozen people telling the same story from very slightly different angles, you do get this wonderful sort of 360 degree look at what was actually happening. And you know, one will tell you what it smelled like in the bread shop, and one will tell you, you know, what the weather was like, and another will say, you know, I, I was wearing a particular pair of trousers. And, and for a non-fiction writer, that is gold dust. I mean, yes. that's, and, and you asked at the beginning, what makes this book a little bit different? I suppose it's that. It's that I could I could mine the memories. And memories are fickle things, and of course they contradict each other, and some people will have different memories, and we all tend to remember things that make us feel better and forget the things that don't. But actually, one of the lovely things about MI6, trained MI6 people, is they have pretty good memories on the yes. whole. And, and this, for most of them, was, a, was an absolutely vital moment. So I was able, I hope, to kind of to pull it together. Do you I, think there's any significance in... Because the Gordievsky story obviously has been around for a long time, mm. um, but the, this is of a different order. Do, do you think there's a particular reason, other than the fact that you had written so well about espionage and other things um, before, why the people involved in the story decided the time was now right to tell the tale? It, it took a long time, I have to say. I mean, I started this five years ago, thinking that I would really be able to get inside Oleg's head if I could, if I could become close to him and get to know him well. But I didn't really expect to get very much else. As as time went on, and I got to know through Oleg the, the various case officers, and they have a duty of care to Oleg, so they are all still involved in his life to yes. some extent. So they do go down and visit him. And as time went on, it became clear to me that they were prepared to talk to me now. I don't think there was an authority from above on that. I don't think word went out from C saying, you know, well, it's, Now's open, the time. it's open season, chaps, yes. off you go. But I'm, I'm convinced that, that SIS knew what I was doing because these people naturally of and course, inevitably report that, back yes. you know, what they're saying. And they were not prevented from doing so. So I, I would say it's not, it's not that this is in any way an authorised book. I mean, SIS no, no, of no course not. control over it. Or, that seemed to be very much interested in it for yeah. some period. Um, the individual officers themselves were not prevented from speaking to me, and that's that is a signal change because MI6 officers are not, you know, they're not they're not garrulous, famously <laughs> no. good at, at spinning yeah. one. But you know, this is a different sort of story, and and the fact that it was a success, of course, is very important. The fact that it was a success when it was running, and that it was a successful exfiltration, obviously, that's that's a story they're happy to tell if it had gone wrong yeah. at the border. They might not have been quite I so be forthcoming. The story. Yes, yeah. What, uh, let's talk a little bit about Michael Foote. Um, it, it, it was obviously the story that the newspapers lit upon. Um, it, had, it was the latest iteration in a long um, running debate about whether Foote has, was a, con connected to the KGB in some way. And it seems to me to nail once and for all the fact that he was, at the very least, an agent of influence. Did you expect that to come up? I mean, when you were researching it, presumably that wasn't what you were looking for. By no means was it what I was looking for. In fact, I, I was as surprised as anybody when when the, the full evidence sort of emerged. To put this into context, when Oleg was coming to London for the first time in 1982, he'd been appointed um, to come to the London residency for the KGB. He deliberately went into the archives in, in Moscow Centre, the KGB Centre, and went through the evidence there. There was a big cupboard, sort of, <laughs> steel cupboard that contained all the files relating Gerald to the Moles. Gerald the Mole file, <laughs> you know, relating to the various people over the years that the KGB had either successfully or unsuccessfully tapped up, you know, who they were trying to get. And there he found 
the boot files. I mean, I, I have a particular pleasure in, in the thought that Petrov, Major Petrov, who was the first person to open the file um, on Michael Foote, thought, oh, it's very funny, we'll make a very good, very interesting, funny English joke here, Foote, we'll call it a boot. It's and a wrote, zinger, isn't it's it? It's a zinger. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's the way he told it, I think. Um, but so B Agent Boot was thus born. And, OK, so was he a spy? I think that's nuts. Of course he wasn't a spy. In the, uh, when he was first recruited in the, in the late 40s and all the way through to 1968, when he ceased communication yes. with, with the KGB after Czechoslovakia. Again, did, again, again, Czechoslovakia is the key event. Absolutely. Isn't it? Yeah. I mean, although that said, he had not broken off during the Hungarian... No, um, 56, 56 was, was okie dokie. Okie but yes. 68 wasn't, no. you know, and that's not unique in his case. No. But what the files showed, uh, Oleg related, and, and bear in mind, he deliberately memorised these files. It wasn't that he was looking back on something that he, that he hadn't realised was important at the time. He deliberately memorised them because he knew that when he got to Britain, it was, the, it was something that MI6 was going to be deeply interested in. Yeah. It was 400 pages. And what it revealed was that Foote had had multiple meetings with the KGB, not just once or twice, not just the odd dinner, but dozens and that he had been paid a considerable amount of money, the equivalent of £37,000 today. Huge amount. It's a huge amount. And, it, you know, this was put into his pockets as he would leave bibulous lunches at the Gay Hussar. What he did with it, we don't quite know. I'm pretty sure he didn't spend it on himself. I don't think he did up the bathroom. I think he... Or buy a new coat. Or buy a new coat, which would have been a plan. Yes. Um, no, I think he used it to prop up Tribune, the, yes. the socialist magazine that he'd edited. The KGB regarded him as an agent. He yeah. was, he, now, that, is a, that word needs to be unpacked because agent in Russian means a different thing. It's not secret agent as in, you know, kind of spy. It means somebody who consciously is working with the KGB uh, for money. Um, he was then later downgraded to a confidential contact, which is the next grade yes. down. Um, what was he giving to the KGB? Well, according to Oleg, he was producing information about what was going on inside the Labour Party, uh, gossip from the TUC, bits of information about where Labour policy was going, stuff that the KGB was genuinely interested in. Now, the KGB, of course, probably inflated. I mean, this is what they always did, would try and make their own agents look more important than they were. So you have to slightly aim off on that. The key question, it seems to me, or one of them, is did Foote know that these were KGB officers? That he it's very odd if he didn't. Well, I mean, he would have had to be staggeringly naive not to realise yes. that these people had an agenda. Um, he later said, now when the case came out in, in 1996... This and, was the Sunday Times. The Sunday Times, when yes. Foote sued the Sunday Times yes. for repeating the allegations made in Oleg's own memoirs yes. that, that Foote had, 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 been in, had been in contact with the KGB. Um, Foote was outraged. He said, you know, I've never knowingly... I can't remember what his form of words was. It was quite clever. Um, I've never knowingly contacted the KGB. Yes. It's actually very similar to the wording used by Philby when he was also <laughs> accused of. Um, and that is possibly true. Perhaps he didn't. But then he was stunningly naive. Yes. I mean, there's that great phrase coined by Lenin, the useful idiots. Yes. Which are, you know, those are people who yes. are, are manipulated, whether they know it or not, into, produce, into forwarding the Soviet programme. And... Michael Foote was useful to the KGB. Do we give him a bit of a, a Hail Mary pass because he was a national treasure, do you think? We do. I think we do. And I think that's part of the fury that this has kind of evoked yes. on, on the left is, is because, you know, he's, he has this very odd position in British history of being a celebrated and beloved failure. Yes. Um, but, I mean, you know, the right, the right will take this story and say he was a traitor yes and the left will say this is a smear against a, a blemishless and man. they're probably both and they're both completely, completely, wrong, completely because wrong. actually yes. the truth is, is in the middle I mean he was he was in contact with the KGB and he took a lot of money that's for readers to make their decision about how they think that sits morally it's interesting because you know you've become sort of the laureate of of this subject and, and others but when you sort of started digging around in the world of Cold War espionage and everything did you ever suspect that a time would come, as it has, where Russian influence in a very different form, an information war, would once again be such a big issue? No, I had no, I mean, really, even when I started this project five years ago, we were not in the, in the situation we are in now. I mean, obviously, <laughs> the Skripal case in Salisbury has, has given this whole story a kind of resonance that that, that is that is and certainly the tourist industry it's in certainly the tourist, absolutely <laughs> but you know one has to remember i mean actually quite a lot of the techniques that 
Oleg was sent out to use in Britain in the 1980s are not so far removed from what we're seeing today. I mean, one of his jobs was to try to plant fake news. Okay, one of his jobs was to pull off people who could be used to spread information that was kind of true and mostly untrue. You know, there's that sort of strange... Because it, one, one, one of the things that's so interesting about the, um, the whole information war today is it actually has roots in the 90s. I mean, that you had people who were ex-KGB mm. who understood long before their Western counterparts this new tech was going to be really good as a means of active measures and that for hundreds of thousands of pounds you could do you could do to the balance of power what billions of dollars had been required to do in the past. Absolutely. There's a kind of ingenuity there, isn't there? Yeah, they weaponized they weaponized the information. I mean it was it was very clever and the techniques were more or less taken directly from the KGB manual. I mean Putin, let's not forget, was a KGB yes. officer and in his own words you never leave the KGB. You know, it's a club you can't quit. Um, so yes, absolutely. So it's you know I think there are very strong resonances, and of course Oleg is in, in now in a safe house under very close guard. I mean, it was always under pretty close guard, but now it's really very intense indeed. What does he make of the new world order, if we can call it that? <laughs> what does he make of the what's going on? I mean, he's a ferocious anti-Putinist. Yes. I mean, he sees Putin as a direct throwback to the the sorts of people that he was deliberately yes. trying to undermine and destroy in the 70s and 80s. So he has a fairly clear line on, on, on this stuff. Um, on the other hand, he's a man of extraordinary bravery. And uh, I asked him the other day, did he feel um, you know, in any way less secure as a result of the Skripal case and this sort of lovely Russian explosion of disbelief? Of course not, it's absolutely right. Just business, another business day in the business office. Usual. Yeah, I mean, of course, he's been under an execution order Oleg, now for more than 30 years. Yes. I mean, he was tried in absentia, he was sentenced to death. That, that order has never been rescinded, yeah. so he is still a, f a formal target. But does he have anything, do you think, to offer contemporary politicians? Because as I was reading the book, I thought, God, you know, this is, this is, this is so contemporary, as well as uh, an amazing journey back into the past. I think he does, and I think it's perhaps, you know, intelligence has, has gone through lots of different cycles in the last mm -hmm. 20 years or so, particularly during the Iraq war. You know, there was a whole issue over what intelligence was for and whether it really worked and whether it was just a form of another form of disinformation. Actually, I think, if anything, this shows that used properly, uh, 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 human intelligence is still the gold dust. It is still the thing that can allow you to see genuinely what is going on inside the head of... And that is counterintuitive mm -hmm. because the whole weight of um, intelligence strategy now is towards information decoding, towards surveillance of uh, digital flows. I mean, what this book says is, is people are what counts. Yeah, finally it's trust and it's loyalty. And, and what MI6 does and has always done is to go to foreign countries and try to persuade the nationals of those countries to betray their own country. I mean, you know, deception is sewn into absolutely the very heart of this, this stuff. Deception for the best possible purposes, you, you, you could argue, as all sides would argue. But it's an old game, and, and to think that it's somehow disappeared in a kind of new wave of digital, because you can fake up digital deception yes. just as, in fact, far more easily than, you can, easy, yes. than looking into somebody's eyes and trying to work out whether you trust them. So in the end, it's, it's, that, it's, that, it's that human contact that is still absolutely vital. Has he read the book? Yes, he has. Yeah. And does he like it? He does. He does. Oh, that's rather nice. In fact, he sent me a charming note saying, "This is, you know, this is this is my life. This is this is flawless." So that must be very satisfying. It is. I mean, I was nervous. I mean, Oleg, Oleg is a complicated person. He can be quite difficult. He can be extremely grumpy at yeah. times, um, and he's very punctilious. You know, he's extremely precise and and sort of. Uh, to a fault almost about about getting it right. So I'm I'm delighted by that reaction. He um he's he's an extraordinary man. He's he's in some ways he's a very solitary figure these days. I mean he always was. It was a lonely road that he chose. Um, and he is a very lonely man. But he's also one of the bravest people I've ever met. For a decade he knew that just one slip and one tap on the shoulder, one 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 tiny error. It was always a game of inches, wasn't it? I mean bullet in the head mm. and living another day was was marginal very I mean, and and very every marginal. day for a very long time I mean the stakes 
were that high. I mean, you know, he was, you know, if he'd been caught, wherever he was in the world, you know, the, the special directorate could have easily picked him up in London, bundled him back to, to Moscow, where he would have been interrogated, tortured, and shot. Yeah. Now, that's always seemed to me to be quite important distinction because, you know, Philby, who is, you know, our great, you know, the great nemesis of MI6 and so on, the stakes for Philby were, you know, he might have been kicked out of the club. Yeah. Uh, the Athenaeum might not have welcomed him back in again, but he wasn't going to be tried. And he was definitely not going to be tortured or executed. It was just a little bit of sensation. In fact, as you rising. revealed, he was more or less sort of nudged. Protected. Sort of wouldn't be a bad idea. So. Absolutely. I mean, people do ask me what the difference is between these two great yeah. spies. And I think that is one of them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. One the of stakes. Them, the stakes were so high. The other one is that, you know, the people that Oleg was identifying to Western intelligence as being Soviet assets, again, faced legal trial. Mm. They were imprisoned. Yes. The people that Aldrich Ames identified and that Kim Philby identified on the other Not side so much. were murdered. Yeah, it's a it's an extraordinary uh, sort of juxtaposition, and I, I can't help but see it as bookended by your book on Philby, and it and it it made me go back to a question that's always sort of troubled and fascinated me, which is it, it was always said at the time that there were others. In addition to the, the 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 Cambridge spies we know of, do you think there there were? In the sense of there being others in it who had been recruited by Soviet intelligence in Britain. Well, or? I mean, it's often we know we know the obvious names: you know, Philby Burgess, MacLean, uh, Blunt, and Cairncross. Mm. Yes, um, but it was often heavily insinuated on both sides and mm. there were others there were others undoubtedly there were others I mean they were you know and there wasn't just there was an Oxford circle too yes they just weren't very good um, <laughs> they, just, they weren't as efficient as are the you trying to no I'm just making a point here yeah I know you are yeah, yeah. there you go um, <laughs> the, um, but, but one of the things that Oleg revealed when he came in 1982 was that actually the KGB didn't have a huge network they weren't these 10 foot giants of myth they did, the, the British establishment wasn't sewn through with willing traitors ready to cough up. There were the Jack Joneses and the Bob Edwardses yes. and, the, and the Michael Foots to a certain extent. And there were other fellow travellers who were prepared to, to bob along. But in a funny way, there is a sort of odd meeting that took place immediately when it came to Britain. And, they were, and one of the characters who was there said there was a slight air of disappointment at this meeting <laughs> because some of the people there were MI5 and they had they were rubbing their hands expecting that Wilson was, Wilson we're going to pick them off you Hollis know, Hollis will get a lot of them and Oleg said no sorry not no. sorry it doesn't happen so I think uh, you know there's a distinction between the spies of the 30s yes, and the spies of the, the spies of the 60s and 70s but no that was one of Oleg's great gifts and it had a very interesting effect on not just MI6 but on Western intelligence in general because it created a kind of a, a new gust of confidence. Yes. Um, this was a KGB that was riddled with infighting, huge vast bureaucracy that didn't work a lot of the time, There were it was an inefficient monster and I think certainly in parts of MI6 and, and the CIA there was a feeling that we can beat them. I want to just conclude talking about your your method as a writer. You're, you know, you're a very distinguished columnist, but you, you I imagine most of your time now is taken up by book writing. Yes. Correct. Yes, You've developed a method which is very, I think, very singular, which is it's it's all about uh, story. Yeah. I mean, over the years, your books have become more and more about narrative drive, the pulse of the narrative. Has that been something subconscious, or have you more and more become aware that that is how people want to read history now? I think I think it's the latter. In fact, I mean, my early books, I didn't, I wasn't consciously doing that, and it, in some of them, didn't really work as a result. I mean, actually, again, it's another debt I owe to to David Cornwall, John Le Carre, who many many years ago we were chatting, and he said, "It's all about jeopardy. It's all about." What are the stakes? You know, what's the dog in the fight here? Mm. You know, where are you? Why is the reader investing in turning the next page? And the spy world is one that usually novelists corner. It's about loyalty and love and betrayal and romance and adventure, and yet it's all true. So, if if I was very lucky with this subject, it sort of writes itself parts of it. Well, but, I'm not sure but, about but, that, but but but. 
the jeopardy is sewn into the whole thing yes. on the very first page. You know, the stakes couldn't be higher. And it's not just the stakes of one man's future. It's also, there are global, there are global issues at stake here. I mean, Oleg alerts the West to the truth that, that, that the Kremlin really believed there was going to be a, a Western first strike and that we were as close yeah, in global terms to nuclear war is at any point since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And so there is a, there, the, the stakes are both global and personal. And when you've got that combination, it's, you know, you're, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's wonderful to write. Because it's, it's something we, we've talked a lot about as we've been sort of founding drugstore culture is that, that s- the best way of getting a point across is through a story. Yeah, always. And you seem to me to have kind of really lit upon that, that, you know, the rigour of your history is stitched into an uncompromising dedication to narrative and storytelling. Well, I think that comes in a way, and you will recognise this, Matthew, from journalism. I mean, you know, everything we do as journalists, I mean, columns, whatever they are, they're stories, they're yes. narratives. They have a beginning, a middle and an end. And if you can, if you can take the reader with you over 90, 900 words, you can, you know, it, and you can use similar techniques, really, to try and take them with you over 350 yeah. pages. It's, it's, it, it, there are going to be ups and downs in that, in that process. But I do think that's, I, I'm not sure I would ever have written a book if I hadn't been a journalist first, not just because of the deadlines, which is the only thing that get me up, but that, but that you know, that actually the, the drive that you, you can get in, in higher journalism is, is not so far removed from, from narrative non-fiction and history but in, in the end it also depends on how much material you can get. I mean, I have been so lucky that I began writing about this world at the very moment that the intelligence services began to open up about it. Well, I think it may be the old adage, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Well, anyway, <laughs> well, that's um, what, what next? What are you going to do next? Well, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm toying with various options. I'm either going to go back into, the dis- into a, a very much earlier period. Really? Or, I, or I, I, I'm still fascinated by the Cold War. I think it has so much to tell us yes. about the world that we're in at the moment. So I'm, I'm looking at various options in the, in the sort of more modern bit as well. And will, and we, will we see this on the screen? I hope so. I've, I've, the film rights have indeed been been bought for Absolutely. a for a for a, um, for a multi part series. Oh, and the idea is to do a slow burn and actually to do it in concert with the Philby story. So the first six episodes will be the story of, of Kim Philby, the you know the, the KGB spy in the heart yes. of MI six, and then the second six episodes, the plan is will be the MI six spy in the heart of the KGB. Machine. It's interesting, isn't it? How. Um, the, it, one would instantly have thought in the past of the movie, but now television drama is such a high art. Well, I, it's, it's almost preferable. Well, it just seems to me that I, you know, there's there is some lovely detail in here. Yes, that the spy it would get, it would get lost in an hour and a half. It would, and in an hour and a half, it would become an adventure story, which would be great—an adventure story about an escape from Moscow, which of course is a vital part of the story. But it, it, you know, in an hour and a half, exactly, it would be just it would be, it would be diluted. I think so. So I'm, I'm very excited about that, and it's going to be good fun. It'll be lots of fun, and a lot of fun is this wonderful book by the Spy and the Traitor. Fantastic book, Ben McIntyre. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Thank you.